True Millenarianism by MatthewVashawBibleProtector.com True Protestant traditional revolutionary millenarianism is the view that God is working in history to bring about the restoration and recovery of blessings for his people prior to the end. After this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof and will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things, Acts chapter 15, verse 16, 17. In the 17th century, about a hundred years after the Reformation, Northern Europe is now Protestant, rejecting Roman Catholicism even by force. The Protestants proclaim that they are being faithful to the original teachings of the New Testament. Besides conflicts with Catholics, there are different forms of Protestantism, including the rise of heresies. Some of the problems doubtlessly also originate from Jesuit workers who seek to overthrow the faith of some. On the continent, there are Lutherans, primarily in Germany and Scandinavia. These are against the Calvinists, who are to be found in Geneva, Holland and parts of France. There are also Anabaptists and others. In Britain, Protestants divide between Anglicans and a growing array of kinds of Puritans. Puritans tend to emphasize personal faith over ceremony. Some go to America. King James of Great Britain attempts a middle path between Puritans and Scottish Presbyterians and Anglicanism. This policy is successful and the English Bible which is made in his name is accepted more and more over the years and is used by many Puritans. A mixture of ideas have been coming into Europe from paganism, Judaism and heathen religions. One of these teachers, a contemporary of Martin Luther, is Paracelsius who mixes medical research with occult ideas. Occultism appears both in England and in Germany. The Elizabethan, John Dee, dabbles into astrology and communing with devils. In the second decade of the 17th century, Rosicrucianism begins in Germany. J. V. Andre, a German Protestant, seeks to promote an educational and scientific revolution. Sir Francis Bacon, his contemporary, promotes similar ideas. Both these men reject the excesses of Rosicrucianism. From 1618, the Thirty Years' War breaks out in Germany. The first twelve years of the war see Roman Catholic victories. The difference between Calvinism and Lutheranism is also apparent throughout Europe. In 1618, the Synod of Dort shows the division between extreme Calvinism and extreme Arminianism. The former say that Christ died only for some, the latter say that God is awaiting for whoever is willing to respond to the gospel. The German theologian John Alsted, a Calvinist living in the midst of the Thirty Years' War, comes up with a positive view about the millennium, expecting that history is moving towards Christ's victory in history. Joseph Mead embraces millenarian thinking and writes a commentary on Revelation Clavis Apocalyptica in 1627. Mead, a Cambridge scholar, goes on to preside over the official editing of the King James Bible in 1638. In his book, Mead interprets Bible prophecy to show that the Jews must be converted before the Second Coming. The tide for Puritan victory, Protestant victories in the Thirty Years' War comes with the Swedish king Gustavus Adolphus. He dies in battle in 1632 after which the Swedes work with the French to defeat Germany, known then as the Holy Roman Empire. The Peace of Westphalia comes in 1648. Comenius is influenced by Alsted, Bacon and André. Suffering persecution in Germany, he moves from nation to nation, living in Sweden, England and Eastern Europe. Comenius believes in the millenarian view, which includes widespread education and accruing of knowledge. This is called pansophism, based on the prophecy in Daniel chapter 12 verse 4 that in the end times knowledge shall be increased. A close friend of Comenius, Samuel Hartlib, who studied at Cambridge when Bacon was there, moves to England from Poland due to the Thirty Years' War and begins to build up a large network of like-minded correspondents. 
Hartlib, called an Ingeniosi, runs a wide-scale, semi-secret society with his circle of correspondents. They uh, focus on pansophy, all kinds of science, Bible prophecy and Puritanism. These are known as the Hartlib Circle. Hartlib's correspondents include those who are closer to the ideas of Rosicrucianism, and these in particular are sometimes called an invisible college. Educational reform and scientific advancement are viewed from the basis of Protestant thinking. John Dury, a close friend to Hartlib and Comenius, attempts to bring peace between the Lutherans and the Calvinists throughout Europe. The idea of a Protestant Union is later pursued by Oliver Cromwell. In the Swedish territory in Eastern Europe, a group of Germans tried to set up what they call Antilia, a kind of island retreat near Rigia, for their work. Usually, however, utopian ideas are limited to published stories about perfectly ordered island societies. The Antillian projectors then consider moving to Virginia, and after that propose the East Indies via Muscovy, Russia, but their ideas fall through. Hartlib and Gabriel Platz proposed their own vision, called Macaria, in the tradition of previous allegorical utopian works and drawing upon the ideas from Sir Francis Bacon's New Atlantis, which describes an unknown land in the South Pacific Ocean. Scotsman John Dury, the German scientist Samuel Hartlib, and the Czech educationalist Comenius, each had each been profoundly influenced by the millenarianism of Ulsted and Mead, and seemed to have seriously entertained the idea that London was the centre from which human knowledge and divine rule would spread. J. Coffey, 2006. Things are coming to a head in England. King Charles dissolves Parliament and rules alone for about a decade, taking to extremes the doctrine of the right, divine right to rule. The autocratic Archbishop of Canterbury, William Lord, is more and more provocative against Puritans. The Scots rebel and march in England. This is known as the Bishop's Wars. The Scots Presbyterians are called Covenanters. King Charles is forced to recall Parliament in order to get much-needed funds for his wars with the Scots. Charles and Parliament are soon in conflict, and one confrontation leads to another, and these become known as the English Civil Wars. These wars of the Three Kingdoms, viewed in the context of the Protestant gains in the Thirty Years' War, show how the various denominations of Protestantism now seek to win the day. In Ireland in 1641, there is a Catholic rebellion with horrible massacres against the Protestants. Nothing is done to save them, except that they flee to Dublin or Ulster. The English government in Ireland begins to fight the Irish rebels, known as the Confederates. In 1643, King Charles's faction in Dublin makes peace with the Irish rebels, leaving the parliamentary Protestants and Scots to battle in Ireland alone. George Fitzgerald, 16th Earl of Kildare, Michael Jones, who goes to England to fight for a few years, and a group of others make a society in Dublin for the protection of Protestants. They eventually connect to Oliver Cromwell and to the Hartlib Circle. King Charles's side in the English Civil Wars are called the Royalists and are nicknamed the Cavaliers. High Anglicans and Catholics are on his side. Some of Hartlip's correspondents are Royalists. The Scots promise to help the parliamentary forces in England but force them to become Presbyterian. The Parliament begins to divide between this and those who stand for freedom for Protestant faith and worship. The Westminster Assembly creates a confession which is forced onto all parliamentarians. Oliver Cromwell, a member of Parliament for Cambridge, is unhappy with the quality of Parliament's armies, so he raises his own from around East Anglica, Anglia, the Eastern Association. This is called the New Model Army. Officers in the New Model Army are chosen for their ability and their godliness. I had rather have a plain russet-coated captain that knows what he fights for and loves what he knows than that which you call a gentleman and is nothing else. The Irish Confederates join up with Scottish Royalists and attack the Covenanters in Scotland. Montrose's campaigns become less and less successful and in the end the Irish and Royalists are defeated there. The parliamentary forces, known as the Roundheads, defeat the Royalists in England. 
King Charles surrenders to the Scottish Covenanters, who hand him over to the English Parliament. Irish Catholic Confederates defeat the Scottish forces in Ulster. Ormond, the leader of the Royalists in Ireland, makes a full alliance with the Irish Confederates. There is a split in the Covenanters in Scotland, and the faction who make a deal with King Charles join with the Royalists and invade England. Lord Torfekin speaks against this. They are defeated by Cromwell's new model army at Preston. The new model army considers questions on religion and political philosophy. Colonel Pride purges the Presbyterians out of Parliament, leaving a rump of Puritans who are favourable to the army's position. The Parliament executes King Charles in London, after being tried in a special court. England thus becomes the Commonwealth. The regicide is questioned today by compromised Christians who think that all killing is wrong. Parliament was the providential instrument God used to punish a king who had rebelled against him and since he had betrayed his coronation oath by turning to Catholics as well as his tyranny and blood guiltiness. Michael Jones, now leader of the parliamentary forces in Ireland, obtains Dublin from the Royalist Ormond. He also defeats him in battle afterwards. With the arrival of Cromwell, they begin to retake Ireland and end the Catholic rebellion. Enemies today accuse Cromwell for his treatment of Irish rebels at Drogda. In reality, massive outrages were perpetrated upon Protestants both in Ireland and in Scotland by Catholics in those years. Further, those who resisted, by not surrendering, in a siege were to be executed in warfare, and this was well known. King Charles' son, Charles II, takes the Scottish Covenant, and Royalists and some Scots move against England. The mood in Middle England shifts against Charles II. Cromwell invades Scotland and defeats the Covenanters at Dunbar. Cromwell's forces then defeat the Scots and Charles II at Worcester. Young Charles flees to France. In the Commonwealth, the power of government comes into Cromwell's hands. In 1653 he is made Lord Protector. Under him the millinery program comes into reality. Hartlib and his friends are vindicated for not leaving England and Ireland. During Cromwell's rise to power, the fifth monarchists who believe that the Kingdom of Christ is at hand and is to be taken by force become so fanatical that they call Cromwell the Antichrist and plot against him. This extreme form of early postmillennialism move beyond the millenary views of that era. Their movement is thwarted. William Petty, who was with Cromwell in Ireland and member of the Hartlib Circle, writes on the settlement of Ireland. This puts into practice the principles of applying the Antillian or Macarian advancements into the Irish colony. One of the Hartlib projects is the proposal to increase education. In 1657, Cromwell charters a new university at Durham with Hartlib Circle members. Science and learning thrives, and many inventions are patented. Hartlib himself receives official patronage, and various members of his extended circle prosper, like Sir Robert Boyle and Sir Anthony Morgan, who later found the Royal Society. All aspects of the Commonwealth thrive under Cromwell's rule. Importantly, the King James Bible is printed under his authority. The Jews are invited to move to England, not only for their wealth, but in the hope of converting them to Christianity, as Joseph Mead himself had recognised. Cromwell is completely sold to millenarianism, saying, Truly, it puts me in mind of another scripture, that famous psalm, 68th Psalm, which indeed is a glorious prophecy, I am persuaded of the gospel churches, it may be of the Jews also. There it prophesies that he will bring his people again from the depths of the sea, as once he led Israel through the Red Sea. And it may be, as some think, God will bring the Jews home to their station from the isles of the sea, and answer their expectations as from the depths of the sea. But, at all events, sure I am, when the Lord shall set up the glory of the gospel church, it shall be a gathering of people as out of deep waters, out of the multitude of waters. Such are his people, drawn out of the multitudes of the nations and people of this world. Cromwell describes the English Protestants as the best, as a people that have been, like other nations, sometimes up and sometimes down in our honour in the world, yet, but yet never so low but we might measure 
with other nations. Puritanism has been much maligned because of witch findings and the banning of Christmas horse racing and drunkenness, most of which has been exaggerated since 1660. For a period of time, certain major generals were sent to police England on these matters, but these were recalled. Vincent Bobrick in Wide as the Waters Be, the story of the English Bible and the revolution it inspired, wrote, The church had been looked upon primarily as an instrument for securing by moral and religious influences the social and political ends of the state under the commonwealth. The state, in its turn, was regarded primarily as an instrument for securing through its social and political influences the moral and religious ends of the church. The aim of the Puritan had been to set up a visible kingdom of God upon earth. In the Puritan theory, Englishmen were the Lord's people, a people dedicated to him by a solemn covenant, and whose end as a nation was to carry out his will. For such an end, it was needful that rulers as well as people should be godly men. Godliness became necessarily the chief qualification for public employment. So far from being against monarchy, the Lord Protector behaves in every way as a king, bestowing knighthoods and titles, upholding traditions and using the crown in pictures, and being referred to as Highness, living at the Palace of Whitehall, having a privy council, wearing ermine, etc. etc. Various royalists and leaders join with Cromwell. Those like Secretary of State John Thurlow and those who receive titles from Cromwell are reissued titles and are recognised under the restoration of Charles II. Millinery hopes did not die in the restoration, though Hartlib was forgotten, Cromwell shamed and Christianity realigned, but Cromwell's experiments had not failed, with the great progress and useful results benefiting all for years to come. John Milton writes of restoring the good old cause, but I trust I shall have spoken persuasion to abundance of sensible and ingenious men, to some perhaps whom God may raise of these stones to become children of reviving liberty. The green ribbon, which was not Catholic nor Masonic, becomes one of the symbols for a particular society and movement which continues to honour those which Cromwell had laid the foundations for. Its true meaning is for the millinery restoration in society. The great work continues by authority of the Bible Protector Ministry which upholds the word and spirit, the publishing of the gospel, spiritual nobility, proper tradition and the biblical basis for national education. We must be people who claim our undoubted right to the Word of God and its exaltation in Australia, New Zealand and the Isles of the South Pacific. We must trust that God in His mercy and grace among the Gentiles is advancing us beyond the threshold into the very centre of the promises and prophecies by the refreshment of the church remnant and by the raising up of Christian governance. We must view the King James Bible not merely as the history of Israel and the early church, but as our book, and to its prevailing by us, in multitudes of peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Bible Protector. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Isaiah 52 verse 7. But now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Romans 16.26 A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels, to understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise, and their dark sayings. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you, I will make known my words unto you. Proverbs chapter 1 verses 5, 6, 23. In drawing from Protestant traditions, the outpouring of the Spirit, along with the possessing of the King James Bible, is necessary as the spiritual foundation for revived millenarianism. The Pacific Union of Australia and New Zealand, along with South Pacific, Indian Ocean and Antarctic areas, provides the locale for the millenary work by the restoring of the Commonwealth and the reclamation of undoubted rights pertaining thereunto. 
With the direct connection to the Whig tradition, especially from the American influence, and the Tory tradition, especially from Britain, the best institutions and political methods must continue. Lawfulness and authority must be upheld and enhanced. The English-speaking world, known also as the Anglosphere, is the best source to draw upon. The origin of this people is the nation of Ashkenaz, a people who aided King Cyrus in the conquest of Babylon, and who providentially have been planted into Australia and New Zealand, possessing the very best religion in the world. The call is for all to join this bright future where we, full of millinery expectation, may join with Sir Henry Parks, who wrote, Standing before the uplifted veil, let the meanest of us breathe a fervent prayer that the Almighty may guide the young Commonwealth on the high road of her starry future, that her people may be abundantly blessed within these encompassing seas of peace, and that their influence beyond may be a blessing to all mankind. BibleProtector.com